Oh, hello, dear. There you are again. You know, to hell with it. Let's have more cryptids. Of course, officers. Is there a particular cryptid you two are interested in learning about? Hey, you promised you'd only ask about one cryptid. The lieutenant pauses, thoughtfully. Something in him breaks. Ah, oh, fuck it. Let's have more cryptids. Well, the most dangerous cryptid is thought to have been the Gnome of Jeroma. None of its victims survived. Grieving relatives never even found their bodies because the Gnome's venom dissolved organic tissue almost entirely. It was, reportedly, a small creature with webbed fingers and a protruding forehead and a gangly little thing. Quite scary to look at. A couple of campers found it when it was already dying. They heard an odd wailing in the woods and followed the sound. They were scared and wrapped it in tarpaulin to suffocate it. It still took the gnome of Jeroma an entire day to die. If the body of the creature was found, why aren't there detailed illustrations of it in science textbooks, confirming the existence of this very little species? Alas, the first scientist who got his hands on the creature's corpse put it in a jar of formaldehyde, thinking that would detoxify the gnome's venom. Instead, all the venom leaked out of the creature's teeth and into the surrounding liquid, dissolving the creature itself. A poetic end, perhaps, but a real loss for science. Alas, always alas, and then it was gone. Isn't that overly convenient? Sure, a perfectly good explanation. It dissolved in its own venom. Go on then, ask about more gnomes or whatever. Cryobacter catlensis. Yes, a unicellular bacterium that was discovered in one of the northernmost points of Kotla, on the Boreal Plateau, by renowned geologist Caitlin Mijanu some 70 years ago. The bacterial colony Mijanu found had remained alive while frozen in ice for longer than anyone could reliably estimate, certainly from before recorded history. Mijanu disappeared shortly after injecting herself with the bacteria she had brought back to study, no doubt in hopes of prolonging her own life. Everything has a price, sweetie. After Mijanu treated herself with the bacteria, she stopped aging, but also became increasingly eccentric and irascible, so that even her oldest friends were forced to pull away. We can assume that she has been living somewhere in the wilderness for decades now, all alone except for the cryobacter catlensis coursing through her bloodstream. That would be the giant of Kokonur. The giant lives in the most arid parts of the vast Kokonur Desert in South Samara, casting a strange light across the barren wastes. A mirage or a psychogenous luminance. No one knows for sure. It is like an awful mountain appearing from below the horizon and expanding to cover almost a third of your field of vision. The towering luminosity of Kokonur is a bad omen in local folklore. Some say it's a Fata Morgana, others, fate unimaginable. Pooyer. No animal can be that large. It's a mirage. That's what makes it so peculiar. A species surviving at the very limits of scientific law. The giant of Kokonur must be the largest animal the planet can support. There are limits, you see, to how large a metabolism.
gravity anomaly? Digging it. Digging this parascientific stuff right here. What an interesting question. And the answer is, yes, there are. Of course. All fairy tales have someone or something invisible in them. It's the Kol de Mama Dakwa. Its name means thin whisper of sound, and that's precisely what it is. Self-replicating sound waves, invisible and intangible. The Kol de Mama is very afraid of us, which makes it incredibly difficult to track. It could be. As I said, it could be everywhere. And we wouldn't know any better. It could be ringing all the days of our lives and nights. Like nothing, it's such a high-pitched sound that us humans can't hear it, nor can other animals. It could be ringing right outside your window and you wouldn't even know it. it could be anywhere, everywhere even. Fine, I'll bite. How can an animal be a sound? Many scientists have asked the same question. Some have claimed that it isn't itself a sound, but a tiny corpuscle that emits sound waves. But there's no evidence to support this theory. Plenty. It's the evidence that led to its discovery. In the 20s, a group of areopagi ornithologists, that is, scientists who study birds, we're trying out a new recording technology for capturing sounds outside the range of human hearing. When playing back recordings they had made in the foothills of the Ea mountain range, they noticed certain anomalies, patterns that seemed random at first, but on closer examination were consistent with the waveforms of songbirds. The scientists soon discovered they could track and even predict what appeared to be feeding, mating, and migration patterns based on sound waves in a strictly delimited range of ultrasonic frequencies, even higher than those of the highest pitched bat calls. She transforms, when speaking about these strange animals, into a confident woman. They realized that they had discovered a new species and called it the Col de Mama Daqua, after the Paracanassian name for the Voice of God, which is said to be very silent. Mm -hmm. They grew quite obsessed with these little birds. Even though they couldn't see them, they could distinguish among individual birds and even began to name some of them. Sequester, Time, Joss Can, those are but some of the Mamadakwa they followed individually. That is a sad story. A group of university students assisting with the field work in their enthusiasm for the project, and no doubt because they were preoccupied with impressing their professors, nearly drove it to extinction. They tried to communicate with it and had no other means but sound. So they started sending out sound waves at frequencies they thought might match the Mama Dakwas. And what happens when a sound wave meets another sound wave of the same frequency, dear? This lady really should be a teacher. She's really good at the explaining things thing. Exactly. And these tests were performed so recklessly that when they happened upon the right frequency, well, they wiped out most of the population. After that, the corpuscle appears to have migrated elsewhere. There have been recordings of anomalies similar to those spotted in Ea, but they've been few and far between. It's impossible to confirm the presence of any stable Koltamama Dakwa population anywhere. Of course. A common thread in these. Disappearance and unfalsifiability. I like the story, though, ma'am. I'm glad you did, dear. What about what? I'm glad you like them. But I'm not really one to tell you about all of them. You should ask my husband if you get the chance. He's the real expert.